Chapter Fifteen of One Commonplace Day by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen Engagements. A subject of very deep interest was up for discussion at the Copelands. They were lingering over the breakfast table. At least the ladies of the family were. The doctor had hurried away, his breakfast half eaten as usual, and Holly had excused himself and departed to school. Fanny Copeland, her face all in a flush of pleasure, poured syrup on her buckwheat, eyes and thoughts unconscious of the act, her tongue meanwhile moving rapidly. "'Of course, everybody will be there who is worth meeting. The Flemings always give delightful entertainments. They say Josie is a perfect lady at home, though she hardly ever goes out without offending somebody.' Mamma, I ought to have a new dress for such an occasion. I have worn my blue silk everywhere for the last two winters. Mrs. Copeland could on occasion be a very determined woman. There was no hesitation in her answer at this time. That is quite out of the question, Fanny. I wonder that you don't know it without asking. The blue silk is very pretty yet. You have not worn it so very frequently, and you have never been to the Flemings in it. "'Child, look at your plate. You are flooding it with syrup.' Fanny laughed good-naturedly. The blue silk was really not a very sore subject with her. "'That is true,' she said. "'I have never worn anything at the Flemings. It is the first time they have honoured me with an invitation. I must be indebted to you for it, Mildred. Josie Fleming likes to get all the stars about her. Mamma, I must have some new slippers anyway, and gloves.' They will dance all the evening, I presume. Charlie Lambert says Josie doesn't know how to entertain people in any other way. I never saw a more absurd boy than Charlie. He is always making sharp speeches about people who dance, and yet he dances every chance he can get. He will be after you the first thing, Mildred. See if he isn't. He is always eager to have a new name on his list. What a strange evening to select for a party! said Mrs. Copeland. I should think the Flemings would have more respect for their New England origin than to have a large company on Saturday evening. Oh, I know why that is. Gus Fleming is here. He has just run up to spend Sunday, and must be off again on Monday. Besides, Mamma, they don't call this a party. It is just a few friends, the note says, though that means anywhere inside of a hundred. Josie Fleming is never particular about the truth. Mrs. Copeland laughed. You don't speak in very high terms of your friends, I must say, Fanny. Mildred will be wondering what remarks you make about her when she is absent. No, she won't, Mamma. Mildred knows me better than that. Friends? I wonder when I ever pretended that Josie Fleming was a friend of mine. There isn't a person in Eastwood whom I like so little. But for all that, she gives elegant entertainments, and one meets all the nice people there, and I am very much obliged to Mildred for visiting me and getting me an invitation. What shall you wear, Milly? And now Mildred, who had several times opened her lips to speak and closed them again, made herself heard. I think I must get you to carry my regrets if you will excuse me from going but this produced an outburst of dismayed inquiry. Why was she not going? Was she sick? Offended? Had anything happened? Of course Fanny would not go without her. Fanny's pleasure in the invitation had largely been that now her friend would be entertained in the style to which she was accustomed. Mildred could not suppress a smile. Evening parties were no novelty to her. They had bored her too often." She was not accustomed to seeing them made matters of such importance. However, she must make some explanation. Nothing had happened, she was quite well and entirely happy, and had a nice scheme for the evening. Miss Wainwright had given her a special invitation to her house that evening. She had met her on the street when she went out to walk with Holly. "'Miss Wainwright! How very strange! Was she going to have company, and on Saturday evening, too?' Oh, no, there was no company, at least not what the Copelands meant, and Mildred felt her face glowing. There was a subject on which she had not learned to speak frankly. It embarrassed her to say that she had received and accepted a special invitation to the temperance prayer meeting. 
to prayer meeting repeated fanny what an idea i mean how queer to think of your promising to go a prayer meeting in a house seems real queer anyway well it does mamma of course it is all right but then why mildred powers you don't pretend to say you consider that a sufficient excuse for not going to the flemings why not mildred questioned she certainly had replied that she would come wasn't that an engagement yes but it was only a prayer meeting people understood of course that something might hinder her but what had possessed her to say she would go in the first place fanny did not understand it and her guest felt like a hypocrite she gave close attention to her knife and fork for a few minutes then laid them down and spoke earnestly the truth is fanny i want to go i have changed very much in some respects during the few months since you and i were in school together i have been intending to tell you but some way i did not seem able i never used to go to prayer meetings of any kind when i could help it you know that but i have learned to pray and like to go where people are praying better i think than anywhere else now indeed they had quiet absolute embarrassed quiet she spoke to a mother and daughter who had not learned to pray and who did not know in the least what reply to make to the startling bit of news fanny ate her cake at last in nervous haste and mildred felt as though another mouthful of anything would choke her fanny was the first to find voice of course i will not go mildred if you don't want to it was mainly for your sake it was well she said this it gave mildred speech again it by no means followed that because she wanted to be elsewhere and had so planned fanny must be held away she was earnest in her protest holly would walk with her to miss wainwright's he had said that he would be glad to do so and fanny could feel that her friend was enjoying herself in her chosen way but fanny was not fully convinced it had been a great pleasure to her to think of introducing her elegant friend from washington into aristocratic eastwood society for you must know that the copelands though eminently respectable had not up to this time appeared often in that portion of eastwood society which called itself aristocratic fanny was young and fanny's father was by no means wealthy two reasons perhaps why fashionable life had not laid large claims upon her as yet but fanny was as eager a young fledgling as ever beat her wings against a home nest and had learned many things during her year at a fashionable school which she longed to have opportunity to practice three months ago when she had known mildred powers well they had been much in sympathy on these points or at least fanny had supposed so she could not yield without further argument why could not mildred send regrets to miss wainwright if it really was an engagement miss wainwright would not certainly be so unreasonable as to expect her to give the preference to a prayer meeting one could attend a prayer meeting at any time while an entertainment at the flemings was certainly not an ordinary event and you are so fond of dancing mildred i was afraid you would not have a chance to have a dance to real elegant music while you were here but the flemings always have the very choicest that mr cleveland will be there of course and i know he dances well from his walk i wanted to see you two dance together mildred fanny's tone was mournfully reproachful but mildred busy with her embarrassing thoughts did not notice it why need she have been such a coward all these things would have been so much easier in their quiet confidences together why had she been so silent all these days there must be other revelations now i have given up dancing fanny given up dancing i suppose it would almost have amused you to hear the consternation in fanny's voice mildred powers the most graceful dancer in the school the one most sought after by young gentlemen skilled in that branch of learning fanny could not understand it what does all this mean she asked almost in indignation why have you pray that question involves a long answer at least it will if you keep on saying why and we have detained mrs copeland long enough perhaps i can only tell you in brief this 
I gave it up because I could not see any way of honoring Christ in it, and I saw ways in which it might bring reproach on his cause. So of course I had to give it up. If you care to hear the long story, Fanny, I will tell it to you sometime. And then they followed her movement and arose from the table. But Fanny said, I am sure I don't understand anything about it. And Mildred knew she did not and could not, for it was spoken in a language that Fanny had not learned. Why had she not told her before? This was the refrain which her conscience repeated all that morning. She saw herself hiding her Bible under the red shawl on the old lounge, and felt her cheeks glow for her cowardice. If she had kept on reading, and Fanny had looked curious and questioned, as Fanny certainly would have done, and they had held a long, earnest talk together, as she had meant to do every hour since she came, what might not have been accomplished? But Fanny was induced to go to the party that evening. In fact, she did not need much coaxing. Her heart was set on reaching into circles from which her youth at least had hitherto excluded her. The blue silk was freshened with new trimmings and buttons, and a delicate lace fichu was bought to cover a doubtful spot in the waist. Over the price of the fichu the doctor looked grave, it is true, and told his wife that it would have covered the nakedness of a family who had called to him as he was passing the flats. But the wife had replied that he must certainly see that his own daughter needed covering as well as the people on the flats. So he went away, and gave to the poor creatures on the flats all the skill that he as a physician could command, and relieved their most immediate wants beside, telling himself that he could get along without a rubber coat well enough, he had done it for ten winters, he might as well do it eleven, and Fanny went to the Flemings and looked like a pretty girl as she was. Had she heard the conversation at the Flemings the morning their invitations were issued, I do not feel sure that she would have gone. I suppose I shall have to invite Fanny Copeland, mother. She has a lady visiting her who they say is a relative of the powers of Washington. If I go to Washington this winter, I shall want to get in with that set. It is queer to have to get my chance of it through the Copelands. Fanny hasn't a decent thing to wear. I don't know how she can come for my part. I wonder if they will expect me to ask that Hartzell girl. Then Fred Fleming had a word to say. Look here, Joe, I have a friend I want you to invite. You met him at the sociable or somewhere. Bruce his name is. He is a good fellow. He clerks at McAllister's. Oh, he isn't a swell, but then he knows how to behave in good society. You girls will take to him, for he is handsome. Doesn't go into society. A bookworm. Spends his nights in studying. Girls take to that sort, especially if they have fine eyes and hair. You send him an invitation. I like the fellow. And Josie, who knew she must humor her brother's whims, if she wanted his assistance during the next busy day, sent the invitation, not without a demur that Eastwood society was sadly mixed, and that she presumed Evan Bruce hadn't a dress suit. However, he had, for he bought it for this occasion went in debt for it. He told himself that he needed a new suit, that his other was really getting shabby, and that while he was about it he might as well get a good one. He had been drinking a glass of wine just before this, or he would not have done any such thing. Fanny Copeland was right in her interpretation of a few friends. There were many invitations. Among them two Christian men were bidden, Mr. Cleveland glanced at his note, said aloud, with surprise in his tone, "'Saturday evening,' then smiled as he remembered, drew toward him his writing-case, and wrote a few words about previous engagement for that evening, dispatched a messenger with it, and put the invitation in his waste-basket, and the matter from his thoughts. Charlie Lambert read his and said, "'Saturday evening,' Good for Josie. Here is a chance out from that queer engagement that Aunt Hannah forced upon me. Odd night for company, though. Pretty hard not to infringe on Sunday a little. Then he hunted for the proper materials, and wrote, My dear Miss Wainwright, I regret to say that circumstances beyond my control will prevent me from being present at your house this evening, so you must not depend on me for the singing. 
Don't cross me off your books, though, and some other time I will do my best to serve you. Still another read his invitation as he walked from the post office. The distributing clerk had handed it to him as he was passing out. It gave him a degree of satisfaction, for Lloyd McLean was as fond of having a good time as he could very well be. This was short notice for a formal party. It was, therefore, probably not a formal party, but just what it promised, a few friends, and the extreme of fashionable toilet could be dispensed with. He had certainly had very few opportunities to enjoy himself since he came to Eastwood. He believed he would go. Just then Mr. Cleveland crossed the street and came to his side, linked his arm in his in an eager, friendly way, and commenced talking without ceremony. "'I claim you as a colleague. I saw you helping poor John Hartzell past some dangerous places last night. I was trying to overtake him, but should have been too late.' you will be glad to know that he reached home safely. Miss Wainwright tells me that she thinks he struggled with his appetite all day yesterday, and came off victor. We must save that man. I wonder if it wouldn't be possible to get him around to Miss Wainwright's tonight, or would that be working too rapidly? By the way, won't you take hold of the singing tonight? We want to make the first meeting a success, you know. Lloyd McLean laughed. He was a merry-hearted fellow that looked almost like a joke. He was being made to appear in a new role, a prayer meeting, and he leading the singing, and in league with such a man as Cleveland. That was a curious jump. His fun had been comparatively harmless heretofore, but it had led him in very different company from this. Another thought, had he really helped the fellow the night before? Poor wretch! He pitied him, and he pitied that pretty girl his sister. She would be at the prayer meeting, doubtless. He wouldn't mind seeing her again. He wouldn't mind being thanked by her if he really had been of any service. But a prayer meeting! Then there was that invitation. Could he compass them both? Hardly. They were in opposite directions, more than a mile apart, and the hour was set for eight o'clock, and Eastwood, while it aimed to be quite fashionable in some respects, was primitive as to its hours it would hardly be the thing to appear much after nine o'clock. And if the Hartzell girl should be there, it wouldn't be just the thing to let her go home alone, and her way lay in still an opposite direction. "'Do you go to the Flemings?' he said aloud. "'I? Oh, no, I am engaged, you know. May we expect you?' Here was a chance to enter two different grades of society. How would it do to make a jump, and take the grade where he would be least expected. He laughed again. It certainly had the elements of a joke in it. I'll come, he said to Mr. Cleveland. End of chapter 15